Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. Welcome back. This is another Red Pill Religion podcast. Red Pill Religion, where we say you don't have to be religious. You really don't. But that doesn't mean you get to lie about religion or abuse religious people. So please support our work on redpillreligion.com. By the way, I would like to mention that uh, redpillreligion.com is now officially a thing if you go and, and visit it. We've only just gotten started. You'll notice there's a little bit of a, that it has just begun started and Red Pill Religion is going to be dedicated to uh, politics and culture. And by the way, men's issues, because we think men especially need to be addressed. Young men are a particularly loss, a particularly fatherless young man. Uh, we are, again, as I've mentioned many times, we are open regardless of your religious point of view, as long as you are not hostile to Christians and Jews. So even atheists are, of course, welcome with their perspective as long as they're not hostile to Christians and Jews uh, and don't spread misinformation about them. Ditto anybody else. And we don't want other religions lied about either because religion is normal and healthy. We have also finally officially begun as of today. Except, uh, we have an official maker support account. Thanks to Godless Cranium for recommending that to us. I'm showing our makersupport.com account out now I don't I haven't still figured out exactly how we use it to ask for funding but we have the ability to ask for funding through it now and we would appreciate your support if we also have uh, if you go to redpillreligion.com actually we don't have it up yet but if you go to escapingatheism.com we take PayPal and Bitcoin we do need your financial support so we can continue to grow this operation and fight against the forces of tyrannical secularism um, and global secular globalism. Uh, all right. And so please give us a like. Please give us a subscribe. Also remember, we were suspended from Twitter for uh, hurting an atheist's feelings and or for the pol politically wrong opinions. So uh, anybody who would tweet this out and tweet it out to the affected parties uh, would be very much appreciated by the team. Um, uh, we've got stuff going on tomorrow night. We got author Susan, Suzanne Vanker. Uh, what Tuesday we got uh, Jim Preston from the. Uh, J We're going to be talking about men's issues for the next two days, actually. Also, I, I noticed recently, and I can't help but go ahead and indulge in what the Jews, my Jewish friends, call Schadenfreude. Uh, I just got word that Jimmy Medeker, with whom I have crossed swords and who I think still uh, did me dirty, uh, nevertheless. Uh, recently destroyed, uh, completely eviscerated Allison Tiemann, the phony, fake honey badger, the phony, fake, non-men's human rights activist who stole the honey badger brigade with the help of uh, 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 ideological sellouts that a voice for men. Uh, you, I, the only thing I would, I, just Jimmy, I love you. All is forgiven, buddy. Uh, please kick her again some more for me. You weren't mean enough. And by the way, while I've been after you, after you Jimmy Medeker, for a year or so, and a half now, I think, to just give me a private conversation so we could understand each other better, if you still won't do that, I will take you up on your offer to come on your show. I would love to give you more dirt on the fake phonies at Honey Badger Brigade and the shit they've pulled and the fact that they're all frauds. Uh, uh, I, <laughs> I got a lot of info on that. I'm happy to share with your audience. You can even still make fun of me, but you'd be better off making friends, with Jim, because we always have agreed more than we disagreed, son. Uh, we just misunderstood each other in the beginning. Anyway, I'd love to hear from you. Everybody would send this to Medicare too with a thank you. I may even put up a special second one with this, because really, uh, a, the biggest thing uh, this all does relate to because uh, some of the biggest pukes in the atheist, rationalist, uh, skeptic community are one of the are the main reason why Honey Badger Radio is such a disaster zone now. No, no, not you, Jimmy. Um, anyway, so anyway, let, let's go ahead and get to what we're actually about here tonight. We're doing a little more on this Aaron Ra video now. Uh, Again, as I've mentioned, we don't just make fun of atheists here, but I mean, because we've got to do other things. Atheists have nothing new to offer the world. They really haven't. Um, just the same regurgitated crap. Still out of deference, here it is. Aaron Ra, we're looking at parts of three knockdown arguments against the existence of God, all of which suck, by the way. Um, but Calm, Calling this video the three knockdown arguments against God is an insult to atheism. Well, you know, right. I, it's 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 not even as good as Bertrand Russell's "Why I'm Not Why I Am Not a Christian," which is still a disaster of a bad essay. 
Um, but yeah, this is, we, we did the part like uh, the first half of this video last night. Um, we're coming back for more of it too. This is just to help people see not only where he's wrong. See, I want, we want everybody to know we're not Christian apologists here and we do bring in people of other religions. I'd be happy to bring in one of my Jewish friends to eviscerate. I, I could actually, I'm pretty sure I could get one of my Orthodox Jewish friends to come in and eviscerate uh, uh, Aaron Ra on his New Testament scholarship. They don't even believe in Jesus, so they could rip <laughs> you to shreds. That's just, uh, and they could destroy Richard Carrier, too. That's an open offer to the whole atheist, skeptic, rationalist community. I know me so many Orthodox Jews who are smart. I can get one to come and tell you why you can't trust people like Aaron Ra or Bible Reloaded or, or, or Richard Carrier for your New Testament scholarship because you, oh, you guys are so awful. You just, you're so retarded and you've got no excuse for it. By the way, uh, we, did, we did the first part last night. We're doing this part now. Why don't we set it up? White Engine, you're gonna more or less take the lead on this one and we're starting on, uh, uh, what is it, 14.30. So you want to, should I just play it or do you want to say something before we start? Oh, by the way, White Engine, our friend and everybody, go ch subscribe to his YouTube channel and Philosophy Tiger, the Filthy Protestant Tiger. Say hi, Tiger. Hi, everyone. Hi, everyone. I, am I am the abomination, abomination in the room. room. All right, so set us up, Engine. You want me to just start playing right now or you want to say something before I do? Okay. Okay. Um, um, Aaron Ross, Ross, what I'd call a venerated nobody, like Sarkeesian. He basically started out as Delahante's lapdog on the Atheist Experience, which is basically pretty much the Atheist version of the Joel Steen show. For some reason, I always found it hard to take him seriously, but since he used to don that 90s Undertaker Genghis Khan look, I originally thought he'd be at least mildly interesting, but after listening to him for quite some time, I found him no different than the rest of the ideologues. Just as condescending, just as irrational, just as theologically illiterate, just as try-hard know-it-all. And as you can see in this video, he tries way too hard. Yeah, I call it aggressive ignorance, and it, 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 you know, it turns into a career for some people. If he put this much effort into being an actual productive member of society, he could do wonders. <laughs> Let's go ahead and uh, uh, he might actually have more friends, too, if he just learned how to get along with people who don't think like him or share his ludicrous religious uh, beliefs. All right, here we go. Third, yes, the only thing that we know about God at all comes from a book that is full of things that are wrong that we've proven are wrong. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry to say this because we've been raised to believe that the Bible is the word of God, and that the Bible is the pinnacle of all wisdom, and that the Bible has all these secret codes and messages, and that it takes all these experts to be able to work it out. But the fact is, we know there is no archeology span that supports the Bible. We can't verify that Solomon ever existed, much less mm -hmm. David, much less Moses. We know that Moses didn't exist. While Solomon and David might have been <laughs> overlooked by archaeological <laughs> artifacts, mm -hmm. Moses never lived. The Exodus <laughs> never happened. And this was admitted, <laughs> this was admitted, <laughs> the first time I've heard a public statement about this was by a yeah. rabbi giving a, um, a Passover presentation where he said that every archaeologist, except those with the, you know, that were devoutly religious and that's the reason that they are archaeologists right. to begin with, every archaeologist who didn't be get into it for that specific bias has admitted that the way the Bible describes the Exodus is not the way it happened if it happened at all. And now mm. we know that it didn't happen at all. Prove your extraordinary claims, which you haven't, by the way. Oh, um, oh dear, oh God. Okay, I'm sorry, Engine. Go ahead, you're in charge. Aaron Ra does not know theology at all, and he doesn't know history at all. Basically, okay. we have ample evidence that the, you know, the biblical scholarship uh, affirms that the Hebrews were um, Canaanite dissenters. That's a that's a fact. Not even the Bible denies that. It just adds that they had Mesopotamian lineage through uh, 
Abraham's uh, dysfunctional family. But anyway, we know that the Canaanites were slaves in Egypt. Okay, like their ancestors. Right. Hello, you dropped there, but uh, yeah, yeah. Now, you've got, we've got, we've got. Uh, didn't you even have some links to help us look at that? Uh, if I recall correctly, um, evidence yeah. for the Exodus. Of course, that's from Faithful Philosophy, but I presume this article will give us plenty of references to back up what they're saying. By the way, atheist, you yeah. don't get to say it's a Christian source, so I won't read it. Oh, what kind of bullshit is that? Really? So why should anti-Christian sources be trusted anymore, right? Yeah, really, exactly. If that's how you're going to be, then if you're an anti-Christian, no Christian should trust you. Also, no Jew should trust you because you obviously hate them and no Muslim. Now, you probably don't like Muslims, but I don't know. I know me some Muslims, and I like them better than most Aaron Raw fans. Um, I want to go. Can I step in real quick? I want to. I want to uh, just to just to drive us forward. Just remember that if you say that because it's a Christian source, it's biased and it's untrustworthy, then you're committing the genetic fallacy. I can do the same thing to your sources. Uh, genetic right. fallacy just me just destroys your credibility altogether. Yeah. Oh, now I kind of wish I had. I I, I, I didn't real. I didn't think of that. I should have asked Rabbi Oliver to come in here and and answer for the. Okay, because Rabbi Oliver is a friend of ours. See, here's the thing, atheists. When you're atheist, you have no religious friends. And sometimes when you're religious, you have no not, no friends outside your religion. But quite a few religious people have lots of friends of other religions. I know me some Muslims. I know me some Jews. I know me some Hindus. I know me some paganistic theists. I got a friend here, uh, Autumn Storm. He swears he's the true form of witchcraft and that it's misunderstood. We're going to be talking about that in the next few days. I have such a wider variety of friends than atheists do. Uh, and I'm sorry, most of the shit he just said about not there not being evidence for the Exodus is garbage. And there's even people who don't believe in the Bible who will tell you it's garbage. Here's one from Joseph's blog. By the way, these are all in the low notes, guys. So, you know, we've got all these articles for you to go ahead and check, check references on. But we also know from the archaeological record that David and Solomon existed. We know that. So he's just... Yeah. I, and but anyway, as for the rest of his bad history, this is a guy who thinks Carrier is a credible scholar and said he was impressed with Dion Murdoch's work, and that woman was a fucking loon. He does know his science, though. I will give him that. Um, you know, at, at a popular science level, Aaron Ron does know the science. Uh, at least yeah, if, yeah, his science videos are somewhat impressive. It, That's where his talent is. But even there, uh, he is cramped and doesn't understand science at all, and he's not honest about science. Otherwise, he would have honestly addressed the, near de the peer-reviewed data on near-death experience, and he would have realized by now that the so-called skeptic debunkers are full of it and are misrepresenting the scientific data. He would know that the digital universe theory of uh, uh, is uh, and the Big Bang theory and the cosmological constant and uh, in, in information we have now in neurobiology showing that the mind uh, uh, extends beyond the brain and its chemistry and and and, it, and is immaterial. I.e., you have a soul. We have all kinds of evidence for that. Um, uh, if 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 Aaron Ra is good, he's probably good at like 1980s level. Uh, basic introductory stuff uh, because he's completely behind the times. Materialism is garbage and there's ample evidence for the supernatural and an afterlife and some sort of, sort of prime mover, Aaron. We've got the evidence in the peer-reviewed data now. Shoes on the other foot. Prove your extraordinary claim we don't. Just like prove the extra your extraordinary claim Moses didn't exist. By historical standards, if the only evidence at all for Moses was the Bible, that would still be historical evidence that there was a Moses, and you would not be able to say he didn't exist. Right, you're um, not going to find any statues or monuments dedicated to a nomadic leader in the Jordan. Uh, well, yeah, which had, had limits, not strict prohibition, but limits on graven images. Um, yeah, no, no, it's 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 not honest. You've got you've got a mighty burden of proof there to say you've proven that Moses didn't exist. I mean, to be honest, I mean, even even still, as a Christian, if I found out that Moses was mythological and a pastiche of a bunch of other characters, I, I, it wouldn't shake my faith that there was a God, and it wouldn't even come close to shaking my faith 
in other areas because um, it's been known for Christians for by Christians and Jews for thousands of years that the Bible does have poetry and things you might call mythology referenced in it. Um, again, I doubt your claim about the historicity, but even if of, of Moses, but even if it were so, it wouldn't really change that much for me. And, I, um, and he's using the Bible to argue against his so-called debunked debunked Bible to um, prove that there's no uh, God or something like that. I don't. I doubt he's ever read Aristotle or Plato. Yeah. Another thing that another thing he has to realize too is that there are plenty of uh, of references such as the tabernacle, which can be reconstructed. There is uh, there's references throughout um, throughout Exodus, which actually details various buildings, pretty much to the T. Uh, when you actually understand the terminology used in the Hebrew, uh, you can actually see those buildings in archaeology. Uh, you can uh, <laughs> whenever it talks when it talks about um, when it talks about the Ark of the Co of the Covenant, you can construct that rather easily, except it will be very, very expensive because part of it is gold. Uh, but at least you can, at least you can, uh, you know, you can, you can substitute things uh, rel relatively cheaply and make a model of it. And it, it and it, you can carry it. It works. Yeah. Oh, but he has okay, a... so should we, I'm sorry. Should we keep going? Because we oh, yeah. Want to after this, I want to just make this clear. Since, okay. Since, uh, since uh, most of those who object to the Exodus, or just about almost all of them, say that the Egyptians never mentioned the Hebrews in Egypt, but of course I don't need to mention that the Egyptians would never record their styles with Moses. Like, I know he didn't bring it up, but I, I just want to clarify this. It's not speaking from an apologetic standpoint, but the Egyptians were known for erasing and or rewriting history when it made them look good. Just like um, yeah. uh, Ram Ramesses II's battle with the Hittites at Kadesh. And although we have evidence of a peace treaty, which means that that battle objectively ended in, in a tie, the Egyptians still boasted victory anyway. There's also, yeah, the, and incident, I wanna, there's, there's I, also the incident in which Akhenaten, you know, that heretic pharaoh who worshipped God alone and, but somehow thought he was the son, he was erased from history due to his religious uncompromising and intolerance with the priests of Ra and Amun. He was so reviled that even his son, King Tut, and the rest of his family were erased from history. Until the 20s, that is, which is why King Tut's tomb was discovered intact, because grave robbers weren't aware of Tut's existence. And not to mention Tut Moses the third attempted to erase Hashiput from history for some odd reason presupposing that she wasn't Bithia, who rescued baby Moses from the Nile, and it was erased from memory, probably due to her having brought Moses into their lives. Then there's also the fact that Pharaoh Mernata was bragging about how he eliminated the seed of Israel, you know, the first outside mention of Israel in the archaeological re record. But these are just few examples of Egypt hiding their shame. So why in the fuck would they care to mention their defeat by a desert god revered by their lowest slaves to the point where all of their gods were subsequently humiliated through the plagues. If word of their disgrace got out, Egypt would have been the laughing stock of the ancient world. And Canaan, Babylon, Troy, and Moses, the biggest traitor in history, why would he get a mention at all? And to top it all, the same year that the Exodus occurred and Moses was given the Ten Commandments is Probably the same year Thutmosis the Third gave up on his annual campaigns, which lasted almost a couple decades, if I remember. Um, also, I know, I know, I know, I know the chronology of Egypt's history is not consistent, even among Egyptologists. But even if we go by some of the proposed traditions, that's where we end up. The most powerful pharaoh of them all, humbled by God itself, and what better pharaoh to make an example out of besides Ramses II? But we know this couldn't have happened during Ramses' reign because there's inscriptions of a steal of Amenhotep III, who ruled between the time of Thutmosis and Ramses, which makes mention of Transjordan nomads they call the Shasu, wandering the desert and worshipping the one they call YHW. Now tell me, how is it that um, third century Jews who never set foot in Egypt and invented the story from cloth knew so much? 
He's going to get that, I, I later, would, that, the, that the story was manufactured in the third century BC. Go ahead. Yeah, I wanted to, I wanted to go ahead and bring up the fact that you brought up that they, that yeah, Egypt sanitized their history. But what's really interesting is the Hebrews did not do that. The Hebrews left uh, the left the shame of their leaders within the text. In fact, uh, there's very embarrassing moments about about uh, David. There's very embarrassing moments about Solomon. Uh, heck, they have a whole poem called "A Song of Songs" about um, him and his girlfriend. Uh, it's a, it's actually a text in scripture. Um, so. It's a whole text, actually. It's eight chapters long. And then you also have to take into account uh, the fact that, yeah, Moses uh, sinned. He struck the rock that he wasn't, when he wasn't supposed to. He had a temper. He definitely had a temper. Um, you, you also have parts where uh, Abraham was shown to, to err. You have parts where uh, that you know got, a guy was supposed to impregnate a, a a lady that he was married to, and he and he didn't do that. God struck him dead. Uh, there was a, there were people that entered the that there were people that were part of the Le, the Levitical uh, lineage walked into the temple when they weren't supposed to. Actually, the tabernacle, I think. Sorry, tabernacle, and it's. God had to strike them dead. Uh, so when you when you're talking about embarrassing moments, they kept this embarrassing stuff in their history, There's a lot which of, shows a lot an enormous yeah, it shows a lot of credibility. All right, you want to keep going? Yeah, I have one more thing. It's called there's a thing called the Minerpta Stella as well, uh, in which um, that's what I, meant, that's Egypt, what I mentioned. Okay, sorry. The, yeah, the Minerva. The, see, the thing about the text of the Minerva Stella is, even though it's on the, it's trying to talk about Egypt uh, destroying Israel and whatnot. There's a That's problem with that one. Yeah, I know. But what I'm, what's really interesting, it's enemy attestation for for Israel. Why would they mention them? That was set, that was long after it happened, though. Oh yeah, but the at uh, the same at the same time there was a war, but there was an there was a war that happened between Israel and and Egypt again. What I'm talking the, about is this 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 is historical methodology that they ignore. At that yeah, time, at that time, uh, Deborah was judge. So at, now at let me year. let's let's keep going, or we're going to be on this point everywhere. Let me just conclude this passage by. These two men, Aaron Ra fans, listen. These two men who do not share my who, who do not share my branch of Christianity, and each each have come different from different strains of thought. Um, but uh, uh, they have more wisdom for you than Aaron Ra does, just on history and science than Aaron does. Uh, really, um, this is stupid. Keep your atheism, and you're still coming out dumber about the Bible than you need to be. Because this is uh, this is just D U M B dumb. Uh, let's right, let's, uh, let's push, let's push that. Yeah. And already works for me, does it? <laughs> <laughs> Good to be the king. It, 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 but, <laughs> <laughs> the story, and you can find this. In no, the no, West that's um. Paris. No, that's not it. That's uh, um. Girls, from 1601 uh, to 1730. You want me to go to straight? I'm sorry, 17. You wanted 1601 to 1730? Okay, no yeah. problem. I'm sorry. Apologies to the audience. We could use your donations to get better equipment and, and more polished production. We really could. Nobody's doing this kind of work on the internet but us. Uh, anyway, um, all right. So where am I starting? Sixteen. Six. Yeah, to oh, seventeen. Close enough, right here. But it didn't happen at all. Moses is not mentioned in any work prior to two hundred and fifty BC. It appears that that's when the story was actually manufactured. Oh. 250 BC. <laughs> yes, that's much. That's much. That's a sooner. thousand years yeah, later like, than when he was supposed to be. And here's the funny thing: if like, you go back to the date that Moses was supposed to have existed, which most people say is about 1250, which is a thousand mm -hmm. years prior to what I just said. Mm -hmm. A thousand years prior to that, you had the Pharaoh Senefru parting the Red Sea. We're doing something even better than that. What? Yes. So while you had in the story about Moses where he puts up his hands in the Red Sea parts, you have something even better going on that's already part of the folklore. 
yeah. was already part of the folklore for a thousand years before the time attributed to Moses. And Moses doesn't actually show up in any documentation until a thousand years after he's supposed to. Um, you had this Pharaoh Seneferu mm -hmm. in, I think, 2300 BCE. And the Pharaoh Seneferu had a barge. And because he's a heads of he's a head of state, you know, heads mm -hmm. of state, of course, need vacations to ease their minds from all the, you know, the, the decisions that they have to make. His vacations mm -hmm. involved a handful of buxom maidens being stripped naked and set at the oars of his barge. So he would watch these beautiful young women rowing his boat. Mm -hmm. And already were. Okay, uh, before before I let Injun take it, let me just ask the audience of Aaron Ra, true believer, cultists. Did you catch the slick little move he just opened that with, which is that the first written reference to Moses is in 200 BC? Let me point something out just about basic historical uh, methodology. Uh, 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 if that figure is even correct, which given that it's Aaron Ra, I doubt, it might I mean it, it could be legitimate could be not I mean even if it is that proves nothing because what you're basically but because it, it people wrote down stuff that was ancient knowledge all the time that we don't have earlier copies of or or that were from oral tradition that is well established and well founded by other uh, methodologies um, it is by no means responsible. It, by that methodology, sir, Alexander the Great didn't exist. And you've got quite a bit else to explain for. But go ahead. Uh, I'm sorry. Uh, this guy is such a fraud. Like the first time I heard him say that, I'm like, I asked myself, did I hear him correctly in dating the first mention of Moses until after the exile? I'm like, if that's so, that's outrageous. Because the earliest complete copy dates back then but with this linguistic style and all that it's the copy on which the that copy was rewritten from dates back to the babylonian captivity and even still there's the jepd theory you know that j is the yahweh source which speaks of yahweh and and gives it credit for um what it does and that that tradition dates back to the 10th century bc and records this and, and records the story of the Ten Commandments. That and the E source, which is the Elohi source, which speaks of Elohim, which basically means higher power. That comprises of the Exodus and is attributed to the 9th century BC. So let's suppose for the sake of argument that they did make it all up. Why? Why give themselves a fictional origin as a slave people when they could have just easily tapped, them, tapped into the historical record and made themselves conquerors of the most powerful empire on earth. No other culture does this, so um, why make any of it up? That's what I'm wondering. His, well, response yeah. his response later is, well, they didn't believe it themselves. They were never meant to. I'm like, how could you possibly know what they were thinking? I, I, have guess a, I have another important point I want to make, too. Um, it's it's uh, uh, among... Any number of historians and, 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 and other responsible scholarly and even scientific sources, um, oral traditions are often uh, arguably uh, stronger than written traditions, at least especially when you're going this far back. Uh, in in pre-literate cultures or where only an elite had the power of the written word, uh, people used to, we don't do this anymore, but they used to memorize voluminous amounts of information verbatim without having any literary skills at all and would pass it on from generation to generation orally. That tradition was still alive and people were like that in, up into the 15th, 16th century, I believe, in Europe. And there's still people like that alive now. And one of the strengths people point out about that is, is that you can find and people will alter manuscripts. But when you're in a community where everybody knows the stuff verbatim, they'll hear you change it. And so actually, even I also otherwise, you, you, and so just dismissing oral tradition is inappropriate in the extreme. Um, so go ahead. I I also want to mention that there is a confliction within the Society of Biblical Literature, which is a secular organization. The confliction is this, that the JEPD, uh, the JEPD theory itself 
uh, has come under heavy fire. Uh, there is a book uh, that is a collection of uh, professional essays. They are technical. I'm, gonna, I'm not going to lie. They are technical because it's scholar to scholar writing. But it's called uh, Fair, uh, Farewell to the Yahwist, question mark. Uh, and so it has come, uh, that's just a sampling of the JEPD uh, concept being under fire. So there is, there's actually a growing consensus at this time that it wasn't a bunch of texts uh, as they were claiming before, just being woven together and stitched together through editing. Uh, there, it, it just shows too smooth of a transition. Um, now, the one that actually does show that it has been kind of stitched together through editing is like first book of Enoch. There are abrupt breaks between the books in it. Uh, when it comes down to the when it comes down to the Torah, it's very very smooth in, in transition. So the JEPD source uh, claim is being shown more and more to be unlikely. Let me and let me go back to the, let me go back to the, my defense of oral tradition in this and at the end the ancient Jews um, when they were you know embarking on the unique project in history of trying to put together these texts that were going to be their sacred texts it would have been a project of people putting together what they knew of their ancient or oral traditions and the the text that they did have to sit together and put down the first compilation of the text that they all agreed were right the, the, even if they were stitched together from other traditions once again so what uh, oh did, and did also, they get it right or did they get it reasonably right or as right as we can expect go ahead also if aaron and his cronies ever bothered to read the whole bible in its context and not just dissect what they want to dissect they would see that in books outside the torah that we know were written before the exile ended which is when he dates the exodus having been manufactured it's in a uh, in judges and samuel and kings amos jeremiah etc the israelites repeatedly said over and over again thank you yahweh for bringing us out of egypt thank you yahweh you brought us out of egypt are you gonna what else are you gonna do are you gonna abandon us now yahweh you who brought us out of egypt and on and on in various books of the bible that were written before the earliest complete copies that we have for the, you know, the Exodus, which he seems ignorant of the language and stylistic writing that suggests that the Exodus itself, after, like you said, centuries of oral tradition, was rewritten during the Babylonian exile. Yeah, and it's, it's also very important to understand when you deal with these kind of texts, they are not written from a Western standpoint. They are written very uniquely in an ancient Middle Eastern context. There is uh, different literary uh, genres that you have to deal with. There is prose in the Bible, but a lot of it is uh, a lot of a lot of books have both prose and po and poetic features in it. And on top of that, uh, they don't use uh, poetry like we do, where we use rhyme. They use parallelisms and different right. forms of it. Right. I'm going to get continue. to that when we, when we get after the, the next part we're going to play now. All right. Nice. Here we go. Uh, we're starting at the 1730 now, right? Okay, here we go. Yeah. For me, does it? <laughs> <laughs> Good to be the king. It, 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 <laughs> the story, and you can find this in the West Car Papyrus. Uh, one of these girls, uh, according to the story, lost a turquoise bobble off of the side of the boat and became mm -hmm. so upset about it that, so, that the pharaoh Snefru called over his mage, Jajamank, who cast a spell over the lake mm -hmm. so that they could lift the lake up and fold it over like a blanket to reveal the turquoise piece. Now, obviously, these stories are told to children mm -hmm. who are not expected to literally believe it. Mm -hmm. These are fables that were never intended to be believed. Mm. But the story of Snefru and his topless rowing maidens and the, the, the blanket 
Lake mm -hmm. became, it's in the same culture. It's a thousand mm -hmm. years later for the story of Moses. And it's actually 2,000 years later before it's actually attributed to Moses that you get to parting the Red Sea, which is not even as good a trick. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's holding the wall. Holding it's, it's, it's trite. There's no, there's no great divine significance. It's obviously a foolish fable, but it pre-existed Moses by a thousand years. Now think about this. I before before the guys who know more than me, because actually I'm not a great Old Testament scholar, and I don't try to be. Uh, these guys are going to know more than me, but I just want to point out the the slick move there. I, I, I sense that we're supposed to not believe that uh, witches, demon consorters, sorcerers, whatever you want to call them, that those have never existed and they never are capable of doing things like that. I guess because Penn Jillette told us so. Yeah, uh, I, right off the bat, um, um, <laughs> there, there is reason to believe there are people with spooky powers who can do things like that. Cr Christians just consider it dangerous. I, I, I'll share the evidence for that with anybody who wants to see that as well. I'm actually a mystic. So, but anyway, the, yeah. It, it, now let's get to the history stuff because that's what we're. Oh, uh, uh, but okay. So here he confuses Snefru with his son Khufu, who the Greeks called Cheops. That's what the story was about. And both of them lived in 2500s BC. He couldn't even get the pharaoh or the dates right. Earlier he said it was in a 2300s BC. Anyway, um, John Currid at a Reformed Theological Seminary argued for the Westcar Papyrus connection, thinking it, it, it was an intentional case of Hebrew polemic. Uh, I'm not sure what the opinion of current scholarship is on that claim. Like, I know writers like Isaiah explicably relate the Reed Sea, not the Red Sea, the, the Sea of Reeds, that crossing to the Canaanite myth of the splitting of Judge River, which was a title of, Judge River was a title of the Canaanite uh, Litanu, a.k.a. Leviathan in Job's Psalms and Isaiah, which Leviathan, who he'll get to later, and contrary to what the young earthers will tell you, was not a pleosaur dinosaur in the ocean, but the mythic personification of watery chaos. Cross's book on the Song of the Sea in Exodus 15 dates that poem to around the late 12th century BC and makes a very compelling case that it was designed to interact with the uh, West Semitic chaos dragon motive, which I've also heard Michael Heiser claim the same. And Heiser is an expert in this stuff, and I think this is the consensus, but this is no substitute for surveying the literature yourself, but I think it's extremely more likely that the pro-sea splitting account in Exodus was associated with the author's mind, with the the West Semitic chaos myth, if anything. That's what our earliest version indicates, and that's what everyone in the Bible seems associated with afterwards. But in conclusion of that, it seems that the sea crossings uh, mythic substructures would have been indigenous to Israelite culture, but even still, did it ever occur to him that Moses, having been brought up in Egypt, would have been intimately familiar with that myth, and when leaving Egypt and when the Pharaoh's armies were chasing him, wouldn't he have like, uh, used that bit of uh, God's power to use that, use it against them as a big fuck you to how, for the Egyptians for um, oppressing the Israelites for so long. I want to add something. Um, if you actually understand Egypt, see that here's the thing. This is the reason why it's very important to understand history, uh, because again, I state I state as a non literalist that the Bible has a context. Exodus has a context too, and when you go to the plagues of Egypt, they were actually mocking. They are mockeries of Egyptian myths. Just FYI. Right, that's kind of what I said. But uh, never mind that those who supposedly manufactured the narrative got the timing exactly right. In Egypt's 3,000 year history, you know, from uh, the time of uh, Narmer to Alexander, the time in which the Exodus takes place is during the highest peak of their glory, whether it be during the reign of Ramesses II in the late. 1200s BC, which is not the case for many reasons, or during the reign of Thutmose III, who was most likely the Exodus Pharaoh, 
the so-called Napoleon of Egypt in the 1400s BC, which not just the Bible's chronology, but also the evidence suggests. Coincidence? How about this? Current scholarship says they were Canite dissenters all along. Yeah, like I mentioned earlier. So, um, guess what kind of slaves the Egyptian owned and where? Canaanite slaves at that time, who had names that reflect the 12 tribes of Israel, lived in Avaris, which was the capital of the High Schools during the period in which the end of the Middle Kingdom and the beginning of the New Kingdom was. Oh, once and again, ladies and gentlemen, links in the low bar with references for the stuff he's reading. Go ahead. Right. The establishment of the New Kingdom followed the expulsion of the High Schools, who themselves were probably led by the Amalekites and ruled over Lower Egypt for more than a century. The pharaoh from Thebes who drove out the high schools, Amos I, did not, did, he didn't know Joseph, see, and likely put the Israelites in bondage, most likely due to the, due their ethnic similarities with the high schools, you know, Asiatic tribes, to, to make sure such an uprising of foreigners would never happen again. Granted, their time in bondage probably didn't last 400 years, or maybe it did, in case the heist goes and slave them first, and the native Egyptians saw the practice of slavery as both practical and useful. So, um, yeah, and guess what time the presence of Asiatic foreigners in general was recognized in Egyptian art? 1900 BC. Around that time, either Abraham was in Egypt, or it was when uh, Jacob and his, and his sons entered Egypt, when Joseph was a grown man, and uh, who knows for sure. In any case, uh, Joseph was quite famous, as the documentary Patterns of Evidence shows, and we even uncovered and put back together a ruined statue of him in Avarice. It's a yellowish man with a r red mushroom hair and a multicolored coat. Remember that? <laughs> that's, that's, if that's not him, and we have no evidence of anyone else that could have been, it's another hell of a coincidence. If Joseph existed, and we have pretty good evidence that he did, why not Moses? And judging by the archaeological evidence, there's no indication as to why those who lived in that town suddenly packed up and left overnight, which is what it looks like from the archaeological. Um, yeah. So should we keep rolling or you got more? Oh, yeah. The store city of Pi Ramses, which the Bible says the Hebrews helped build uh, bricks for. That was built on top of the abandoned avarice, by the way. Sure, the math is off concerning the number of people and some details here and there, but to say there's no evidence at all is being intellectually dishonest and show that Aaron is not reasonable. I mean, this is a Christ myth that we're talking about and an agnostic atheist to boot. And yeah, I want to go ahead. Uh, basically, I what I I want to bounce off of uh, off of White Engine. Um, in the philosophy of history, remember, he's more of a historian than I am, but I deal with philosophy. But in the philosophy of history, uh, one of the biggest things that you have to understand is that we don't deal with absolutes. And so what he's bringing up is a, is a plausible and very highly probable case of what happened, of what, pro what highly probably happened. Um, and that being said, uh, Aaron Ra is not giving a very good case against that. He's not giving any evidence against that. He's just making conjecture after conjecture after conjecture and claim after claim. So I'm going to give it back to White Engine, and he's going to bring us forward. Uh, play the video. Play more of it. You Don't got it. Here we go. Here we go. According to the Bible, you have the city of Ramses, mm -hmm. in which you had two million slaves. Let's say, according to the Bible, it said there was 600,000 Hebrew men on foot. Now, this isn't including the elderly, the wives, the children. Mm -hmm. It's just the 600,000 fighting men on foot, yes. right? At a time when Egypt had only three million people in their entire population for the whole country. How were they slaves? Right. That sounds like why do they just take over? Right. <laughs> what are you going to do if you only got three hundred? If you only got three million people in the entire country, and there's six hundred thousand fighting men in one town, yeah, they're not slaves. 
Mm. They're there by choice. Uh, and so, uh, uh, can I? Can you stop, player, please? Uh, I want. I want to bring in my. I want to bring in my military experience. Um, Go ahead. <laughs> okay, mil uh, military. More of a military expert here. Um, when it comes down to it, you're talking about the uh, the best trained military in the entire world at that time. The best trained military. So let's go back. Let's go into. Let me just. Humans are humans are humans. Let's go to. Let's go to Rome just real quick. Um, Rome was the best trained military. Had a very expansive uh, uh, empire at that time. Romans. The the amount of people under Rome's a uh, rule uh, highly outweighed the amount of people that were Roman citizens. They did not just rebel overnight against the Roman Empire. Because the simple fact is, when you have a highly trained military, very, very professional, by the way, for that time, it is very unlikely that you're just going to go snap to and, and, uh, and go ahead and attack the people that can destroy you, it's, especially when you're unarmed. But like, I, but like I said, but like I said, the numbers are exaggerated. There weren't six hundred thousand people. There probably wasn't. But we do know there there were slaves in avarice. Yeah, what you also have to remember that there are. <laughs> here's the thing. Here's the thing. A lot of people forget about uh, about in ancient Middle Eastern literature. There, there are there are exaggerations in Eastern Middle in. Uh, Middle Eastern literature, and including um, uh, hyperbolic victory speech, uh, which we'll get into later. Uh, basically, these exaggerations, do they really matter in, for the val validity of the text? Oh, oh no. yeah, yeah. They, uh, they, uh, cl they um, say that the, our faith depends on the Bible being that 100% inerrant, perfect word of God, which I don't hold myself. I know that the Bible is not by any means inerrant or perfect the, the word of god it's inspired by god but it's not the word of god the word of yeah, god yeah it, it's so what the, it, what it, the word of god was the 10 commandments and what jesus taught everything else yeah. was man well what we have to remember what we have to remember too is what we also have to remember too is the bible itself the the scriptures themselves uh, to say that <laughs> <laughs> to say that there isn't human agency in there is going against thousands and thousands of years of tradition that says otherwise. These, these exaggerated numbers were a natural thing to a Middle Eastern, uh, a, a, a Near Eastern mind. They would have not taken that high number in a literal sense. So either way, it's not hurting the scriptures being inspired because of the uh, simple okay. fact that the yeah you're you're I'm gonna give it over to you. It's gonna it's gonna talk more later. Just keep playing. Hello. I apologize. I was gonna say I, I was still muted. I was gonna say we are approaching the hour mark. I'm gonna continue. I'm just letting you know we're approaching the hour mark. We can run long on this if you guys want to, but uh, you know, keep in mind there's also uh, we don't have to go the whole way through either. So let's just let's just go. Okay. Out and follow the coastline. Canaan would be a two-week walk. Follow the Red Sea up to the Mediterranean and around. Mm -hmm. And if they started out marching single file, with each man one meter ahead of the next, which if you're marching single file is actually a reasonable distance, right? Mm -hmm. The first men would get there before the last ones left. And we're still not talking about the women and children. Right. We're only, or the elderly, we're only talking about the fighting age men. The 600,000. Exactly. So mm -hmm. that line, they're already there before the last ones left because it's only like 250 some odd miles, mm -hmm. something along that line. Oh, so why would it take 40 years? Because with wow. God's help, <laughs> a two-week walk <laughs> following a coastline, and it's hard to get lost uh -huh. when you're following a coastline, AP has Bible them wandering readings. the desert. Uh, wrong. That's, that's, not, that's not what the Bible implies at all. Atheist, they were... 
let me comment. Atheist Bible readings are entertaining and make a lot more sense with three or four more Negro Modelos or whatever that is he's drinking there. I, I, I want people watching this to just notice how, I mean, even though it's, it's useful to have somebody, one guy who knows history and another guy who knows theology and another guy who knows that, which we've got here, right? Um, but notice how effortless it is, Aaron Ra fans, for us to eviscerate this blowhard. What's he selling you? He's selling you atheism and anti-Christianity and making you feel better about yourself, like you're now superior. And he's actively making you dumber, and he's cutting you off from some interesting people and ideas who won't threaten you with hellfire if you just want to have a conversation and learn about this stuff, because Aaron Ra is actively miseducating you. Ah! Go ahead, guys. Um, like when the, the, the Bible does not imply that the it took the Israelites uh, 40 years to reach uh, Canaan. Like, uh, it took them, like, uh, a while, like, um, took them a while to reach uh, Mount Sinai, which, uh, which that's another topic, which it, that was in Arabia, not the Sinai Peninsula. But anyway, um, after that, they've gotten to, like, uh, they've broken the god's commandments and went their own way and uh, they were cursed to wander the, the wilderness for 40 years or however many decades you think is plausible but anyway um that was because the israelites not only disobeyed god at every conceivable turn but also because they didn't have the courage to fight the nephilim and take back their land that was rightfully theirs so they had to wait until their uh, the next generation grew some balls in a, yeah, in, and in so, speaking. also don't forget that um, here here's the here's the thing that a lot of people forget too is um, it's with a significant amount of people it is a it what it, it it isn't heard of to go to oases and and water holes and and whatnot and it's it's not unheard of, of of nomads to break ground a little bit here and there just to uh so to, for it to be two weeks no i'm sorry that's not how people travel then i've been around nomads too that's not how they travel so he's completely wrong on that um and also i wanted to bring one more thing up uh the the thing about 40 years each time the Bible says 40, all 40 means is many. That's all it means. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a rhetorical it's device a that stylistic, just means many. It's a stylistic number that appears all over the Bible. The Bible uses, the Bible uses, style, uh, uses Near Eastern liter, literary styles uh, in it because it's a Near Eastern text. So does um, so does the New Testament because it's a Near Eastern text. The mo see the thing about Aaron Ra is he's reading in he's eisegeting, not exegeting, eisegeting the text with postmodern 21st century new atheistic lenses, which is not how you do this kind of stuff. Yeah, right, uh, Inspiring Philosophy has a good video on Aaron's claim that it took them 40 years to reach the Levant. And uh, 40 years were punished, their, their punishment after reaching it, like I said. Also, he complains that they shouldn't have gotten lost because they were following the coast. But correct me if I'm wrong, but didn't Egypt have forts all the way of the sea preventing this? Egypt had a – Egypt had – the thing uh, – what, what people don't realize, when you look at the map of the Egyptian empire, uh, the coast, the coast of, of Can Canaan right there – before it became is Judah and and the twelve tribes and blah 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 blah, uh, there they, up that coast you had tentacles of Egyptian of uh, Egyptian empire, so it, it was it was not as easy as they that he, as this guy makes it out to be. They can't just go up the coast and woohoo we're there. This is a whole different world, and so this here's the thing that I have to say about Aaron Ra. The thing about Aaron Rock is he sits comfortably on his ass drinking a beer, which is a completely different world. He's a first, he's a first world whelp, which is not a concept 
back in those days. I'm not trying to I'm not trying to be rude, but just look at the guy. And and he's got and he mocks the that um mana you know what the Israelites ate, you know you're familiar with the term mana. This yeah, um yeah. this substance they ate that that is supposedly snowed out the sky, but in actuality there is an insect in that area where there that lives in the trees, you know, I forgot the name of the insect, but it chews the bark of a certain tree and it spews out this white sticky stuff. It's sugary sweet. That was the mana. Yeah, um, yeah I, and it's it's kind of it's kind of a kind, let's just say it's the it's that version it's the basically it's the it's that insect's version of honey. And it's very sweet. It's very delicious, but you've got to collect it quickly, or it goes bad. Right. That's what. That's that was the. They had to collect it quickly before it dissolved. That's what the story suggests. Yeah, I'm. I'm going to go ahead and 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 fly my freak flag again, and I'm just also going to note that uh, Aaron Ra, like some of these atheists, likes to rock uh, uh, on an occult look and occultish looking jewelry and stuff like that. I make no exact alleg I know I make no specific allegations. I merely note that people in his circle tend to try to do that. I also know for a fact, having spoken to eyewitnesses and seen other credible sources, that there are in fact people into the devil thing who really do think there's a devil. Or there's some in other freaky weird that they, they sort of like look like devil religions, but they think they're their own thing. Uh, there's a cult that actually believes that uh, if they can, th who believes that uh, they are that they can travel to a higher state of existence if they convince you to be atheist and like feed you uh, whatever keeps you in a, in a pit of nihilism and despair until you die. That they can speed your soul energy and go to a higher plane of existence. Now I'm oh, not. I'm not going to say I believe that is true. I don't care whether you believe it or not. There's people who do believe that shit. So for example, when somebody asks me what's motivation to lie other than money, well, some people are into some freaky weird religions. And I'm just curious, Aaron, are you into a freaky weird religion like that, that you actually do think there are spirit forces? I'm just curious, just putting it out there. Go ahead, guys. Oh, speaking of Satan, he's going to get to that later you want to play that one now and skip the next one or you just want to okay well what, what, where do you want me to go at what point do you want well that he um he makes an argument where uh god is from here do you want is, me to start playing from here or another point um yeah from uh 21 from 21 okay all right yeah. 21 close enough it doesn't matter because we have we have God saying that you know Moses is going to perform all these miracles to convince the the Pharaoh, but then God jumps up and runs to the other side of the chessboard to play the other side and hardens the the Pharaoh's heart. Right. right. So God is so lonely he plays both sides of the chessboard. Mm -hmm. Right. So there's no part of the story. I want to be clear on this. There's no part of the story that is possible. First off. And secondly, there's no part that makes any sense. If God exists, the Bible wouldn't describe him the way it does. Mm -hmm. The Bible, and I mean, this is a separate point. Yeah. It, regardless, Slow whether down on God the beer, buddy. exists or not, evolution is still a inescapable fact of population. No Can I stop here, please? Bible is still <laughs> oh, stop there, can, please. He's, he's well into his, his cups now, but in any case, yeah, I, I, I used to be a professional drunk. I notice what it, when I see it, but anyway, yeah. It, here, here's the thing. Here's the thing. When it comes down to the the uh, the Hebrew of the of Genesis one, it, it it actually allows for it allows for evolution. It is not a it, it does it's not structured. It again, it's from the near the Near Eastern mentality of the text does not show that they had a creationist, a young earth creationist mindset when writing that. And on top, <laughs> wow, that, that guy, <laughs> that guy, like that guy blows my mind to even say something like that. Go ahead. Anyway, I, I do agree with him that he's going to, um, He's gonna get to later that the 
creation chapters in Genesis intentionally interact with Mesopotamia modus, but the Jews were just giving credit to God itself. But of course they weren't going to comprehend 21st century science, even if God told them. Like, yeah. Try going back in time and explaining 21st century science to a band of sheep herders. Like in every culture, God had to work with is, is uh, Hindu, Chinese, Canaanite, Persian, and Israelite, etc. subjects and their limited knowledge. Not the four yeah, and, and, GPA students he probably wished he had. Yeah, and, well, the thing, well, when it when it comes down when it comes down to it, uh, you have to keep in mind that uh, you have to keep in mind that th this is this is not a science. The, it, the Bible is not a science textbook. It was never meant to be that way. Okay. Oh, I'm uh, okay. Right, you want to get the, or, get, yeah, keep going. going. So, uh, twenty six, twenty two to twenty seven fifty. Oh, I I forgot one thing. Uh, oh yeah, yeah. The, the thing I, I, I for, the thing like yeah the, the thing the, about him being like, Satan. Like, no, um, hardening the Pharaoh's heart, and so he'll um defy um God and whatnot mm -hmm, and strike yeah. instigate the plagues. Each plague, if you're well versed in Egyptian history, like I am. Each plague was a defiance against a specific Egyptian god. Like um, the turning the Nile red would defy uh, the crocodile-headed god Sobek, and the um, the uh, locusts would defy that um, that one scarab-headed god. I forgot his name, and the uh, et cetera, et cetera, and going on. And um, the ninth plague yeah. with dark and sun would um, defy the king of the gods Amun Ra. And uh, oh, don't. And, and the final plague would devastate the heart of all, well, not and that not all Egypt, uh, everybody in Thebes, because that's where the that's where Moses defied the Pharaoh, because obviously that was the capital of Egypt at the time. Yeah, and so one one thing that's very very important when it comes down to it is what he has to understand is there that uh, God specifically said to Moses that that he will that. <laughs> that he what he was going to do that Moses was not going to let that sorry that the the Egyptian Pharaoh was not going to listen to him now if you understand the story itself in its context there's a reason for him uh, taking the reins right there and hardening his heart he's basically saying I'm in control I'm gonna control this guy I'm going to devastate him and I'm gonna show my glory through his destruction Basically, what what God has a habit of doing in the t in, in Scripture, which is very very obvious, is that he ups he he'll uplift the weak and downtrodden, and the ones that are proud and and prideful in their in their heart, he'll crush them. And that's what okay. he did with 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 uh, with Pharaoh. All right, let's go to twenty six twenty to uh, twenty nine, and then we'll call it a night. Twenty six twenty. To 29. Okay, here we go. And then we'll call it a night, everyone. It's all made up. And then ever since they discovered Asher Bernicle's library about 100 years ago, yeah. we found the origins for a lot of the legends that are written into the Bible. I mean, and we actually found that the, the story of, of Adam and Eve and the, the, the garden with the talking snake and all of that yes. actually originates from a half a dozen different legends from Adapa, so, uh, who was taken before the gods and offered the, the, the fruit of eternal life. Mm -hmm. And he was told in advance to refuse whatever they gave him because they might offer him the fruit of the, the food of death instead. Oh, yeah. So the reason that humans are mortal is because he refused to accept the food of the life that was given to him by the gods. So uh, this is an adaptation. Right, and where did the snake come from? The snake is not sir that the snake is not uh, Satan. Christians will tell you that mm -hmm. the serpent of the garden. I got, I, I, I got to say this: uh, a certain type of Christian who isn't thoughtful and not real well educated on the history would be snaked by something like this, and might start going trying to prove that the biblical account was the first one, and that these others he mentioned cribbed from that. Which, by the way, is uh, one argument you could have, but. There is actually no significance if the traditions that the, that the Jews had it looks very similar to the traditions of other cultures. That doesn't make any of them entirely wrong. Well, yeah, yeah that, and that, correlation that, does not prove the causation. Yeah, yeah. I mean, if in fact, if these events happened more or less as described, 
you would expect a divergent accounts. And then the, the question would just go to be the account you found most credible. So there. It's, I mean, yeah. It's, it's, they didn't just they didn't just they didn't like um just get it from Mesopotamia. It's like this story is told all over the world. Like there's a there's a first man and woman. There's a legend of paradise that appears in almost all folklore, like in in Egypt, India, Tibet, Babylon, Persia, Greece, Hawaii, Mexico, etc. Most of the most of the most of these Edens had forbidden trees and were supplied with um you know serpents or dragons that stole immortality from men or otherwise poisoned paradise so both the serpent and the fig were probably phallic symbols behind the myth is you yeah. know they uh like uh, a serpentine divine being or st like um tempted the first man and woman away from the said higher power but these all have uh it's the same fucking story. They just, there's just so that, different therefore it's spins something on them. embedded. In, therefore, it's something embedded in the human experience and the what we what Young might call the collective unconsciousness. Something like it appears to have had. There's that's evidence alone that something like it must have happened if the memory of it is so universal in humans. You don't get to just say that it's an illusion without proving your shit. Um, you know, and, and again, I would point out to any atheist that anything that's universal in human consciousness like that, there's an indicator that there's something there. Um, you know, even in Jungian terms, I mean, really, it's just, it's, it's, it's ludicrous, this declaration that because there are divergent accounts in other cultures, that means the Bible account was cribbed or that it's not the most accurate one or anything else. And I just want to make the point again, too, some Christians won't like this, but the reality of uh, uh, a certain strain of Christian won't like this, but I will say the reality is, again, these texts of all uh, will all admit to multiple possible readings. And anybody who studies these things will tell you that the spiritual message is what, the most important thing God wants us to get out of it, not necessarily you know the like treating it like a, a a grade school science book or something i mean these people are nuts uh, i'm sorry go should i like, keep going yeah. like a, the bible is just confirming what everybody else already knew like a, it wasn't just the hopulu tree in the mesopotamia myth but it was also called the tree of knowledge it was a it was, they also there's also ones uh, called a uh, yggdrasil and modan and Vel velagva and Kappa Vrishka and uh, Axis Mundi, and then there's the Tree of Life. There's a Etzjaim, Eletva, Fusang, Galkarina, Ished, Ermansul. They all had a for most of them all had a f uh, forbidden fruit or drink of some sort. And so basically, what we're what basically what's what what we realize is. There was a long time ago some some source they got this from some source 